I want to start with a little bit of uh, zooming in on this second concept of lengthening one's timeline. Um, you know, in my experience, anything that takes a long time, uh, you know, if it's a, a marathon, not a sprint, personal habits really matter in the effect of one's personal habits compound over time, stack on, it, on, on, on themselves. What advice would you give this group of mainly folks that are evaluating whether or not this is the right path, ETA is the right path for them? What advice would you give them? What have you seen work? What have you seen not work as it relates to personal habits that have a tendency to compound over time? Yeah. Great question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this in two different categories. Uh, the first category is kind of what you're thinking I'm going to talk about personal habits. And the second one is going to be more about personal habits as it relates to work. Um, but the, the, the formula for, uh, returns is one plus R to the N and N is a, N is the number of years you do something and N is a quadratic. So like, if you look at the actual returns for just about any business or for my life, it, it, it gets logarithmic as you, as you increase the N and to increase the N, you, you just have to take care of yourself. And, and, you know, you make better decisions when you're, when you're energetic, you, you, you show up differently. You will make different decisions. You will make the decision to keep going. You'll make the decisions to think bigger. Burnout is is usually physical. Depression is usually phys- starts with physical. And I, I don't mean to take away from people that have have real issues, but like it, it starts, it really starts physical. So I mean, for me, I I am crazy intense about those things. Uh, so I mean, my my habits are, you know, I don't drink alcohol, I don't drink caffeine, I don't eat gluten, I sleep eight or nine hours a night. I work out every day, cold plunge, meditate, talk to a coach. I mean, it's like let's just start there, and good things happen when you, you know, when you when you take care of your body. Your you know your mind is free to to be a lot more aggressive. Um, so I've I've dialed those things up over the years because every time I do it, I notice more. I, I notice a difference in the way that I show up and the difference in my energy. And what I said was probably sounds pretty extreme to some people here. Um, So you don't have to necessarily do all that, but definitely everything you're doing uh, is affecting, you know, your ability to stay in this race for a long time. The second category I would say is probably the the thing that I think has probably differentiated me more than anything else. And that is, first I'll describe what the sort of average is. So, and I'll use myself as an example, like a bad day for me would look like this. You know, I, I didn't get a good night's sleep. I wake up, I'm exhausted. I commute to work. I fight traffic. I'm kind of flustered. Someone cuts me off on the way to work. I show up, you know, I'm late to a meeting. I'm kind of present in the meeting, but sort of frazzled. Meeting, 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 uh, maybe a little bit of time for lunch. I'm returning emails, Zoom call, you know, emails, fight the traffic home, have a conference call on the way home, you know, then get home have maybe have a quick dinner with the family, get back online and return emails. You know, that's kind of the default day. Okay. Absent intention, that's going to be your day. And you're going to put together a full of quick dopamine hits yeah, along the way. Exactly. Right? It's quick dopamine hits and brainless, really. I mean, requiring you not to think. Thinking's hard. People hate to do it. So that's like your default day. The, the problem with that day is you're going to do today what you did yesterday. And you're going to do tomorrow what you did today, by definition, because you're you're not doing anything to change that. The opposite of that is, and this is hard to do, okay. But if you really want to have, if you want to differentiate differentiate yourself and have a real superpower, like the opposite of that would look like this: like get up at five thirty, five thirty to seven thirty, you're doing deep work with all cell phones, you know, at Wi-Fi, everything off. That's when I'm writing blogs, writing lectures, writing speeches, thinking, planning my days, making my one-page plans, doing the deep, deep work. I can get more done in two hours in that way and those hours with no interruptions than I can in 15 hours of, of distraction. But imagine stringing together that five days a week, you'll, you'll have tremendous amount of productivity. The other part is, I put on the calendar probably a total of three hours a week where I'm talking to a coach and we're like creating a vision and then we're mapping that vision into 
five-year goals, one-year goals, quarterly goals, and then we're putting those on the calendar. So rather than my calendar being at the whim of like whoever's scheduling stuff, my calendar is the stuff I want to move forward on, the priorities I want to move forward on. And like, so you asked a question about personal habits. Like we all have plenty of time in the day to get stuff done. I promise you, you're just using it poorly. And an algorithm most people have to put something on their calendar. Someone says, hey, Graham, can you join this meeting from 2.30 to 3.30? And you know what most people do? They look at their calendar and they're like, oh, I don't have anything. Yes. That's the algorithm. How many of you have some algorithm that looks like that? Right? That's a horrible algorithm. <laughs> That's like the worst algorithm ever. You know, and your answer should be no to basically every meeting unless it's like moving you toward, you know, your five-year goals. So, um, let's talk about five-year goals. I mean, again, playing with this, um, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, my guess is that um, you hear from your students uh, often about it, it, they, they want to focus on, you know, doing a search, making an acquisition, leading that business, and then having an exit. And that's that's sort of like, you know, if, if I can pull that off, that's that's great. And, and then it's and then it's sort of made. But what would you what would you say to the to the current and 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 past students uh, that are in the room around extending the, the the horizon with which you think about this? Like, what are the what are the metrics? Maybe I'll I'll go there. What are the metrics that you would think about? Encourage this group to think about. Are they truly just economic, or are there other ones that we should think about as a group in measuring the the ultimate scoreboard in ETA? And over what period of time should we measure? that set of metrics? Um, well, I'll, I'll give you a couple different ways to think about that. The first one is like, maybe let's say you're, you know, zero to four years out of school and just overall, what should your goals be? And I think there's a pretty clear answer to that, which is someone told me this advice and it's been the best advice I ever got, which is your goal should be to make yourself the most formidable leader, human possible. And, and you should you should do whatever you can to to move you in that direction. For me, like that was finding the people that I admired that had already done the thing I wanted to do and learning as much as I could from them. So if if I had to give advice, the 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 first five plus years out of school, maybe even ten, if you just focus on yourself and making yourself the most formidable person, everything in your life will take care of itself. I promise you which is the opposite of like optimizing your one year earnings you know it's like no what i want to optimize my five year development as a person in terms of the question on eta i mean that 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 could be an entire conference on like when to sell a business and um and i have some very strong views on this which is what i was kind of saying before which is the returns are 1 plus r to the n and n is quadratic and most people do all the heavy lifting and all the hard work and they have the mission and they go through all the process and they get the business where they actually, it's exciting and then they sell. It's like the dumbest, most value destroying thing you can do. <laughs> and the reason that you sell when you're in that, in that time is two things. One is you're so close to the business that you see all the warts, you know, you see all the bad things and you're, you're, you're nervous because you're like, you're in it, you know? And, and so you see all, I mean, you deal with all the problems, all the stuff I was talking about before. Um, and so you have this kind of skewed view that it's a lot worse than it is because you're so close to it. And then the second reason people sell too early is liquidity. It's like, hey, I'm five years out of school. I have 110% of my net worth in this one thing. But guess what? You can solve liquidity without selling the company. There's 30 different ways to... The, the selling a company is like playing the piano with boxing gloves on. <laughs> you know, like It's a very blunt object to get liquidity. It's a horrible idea. In most cases, you're better off working with your investors to find out a way to get liquidity, reset your options, take some money off, whatever, and keep going because the thing that you're working on is probably the path to you having the more success than selling that and starting over with something else. You just don't know the warts of the something else yet and you know the warts of the thing you have. We've made more money in year eight and nine in one business than we made in years one through five and 30 other businesses combined. So it just gets logarithmic and you got to give it that air to get there. 
well, which no one does. I, I, I think that one of the cool things about the ETA community that, that we've seen develop over the years, you know, t- 10 years into this conference, crazy, crazy to think about that. But there are now more and very talented investors, advisors, mentors that can help you as an entrepreneur, you know, because they're not as close to the day to day and the warts and, and sort of. So, you know, that community has really developed and rallied around these entrepreneurs. And I think that the, the model has evolved such that there are very available mechanisms to, to do what you're saying, create liquidity in a way that maybe, you know, 10, 20 years ago uh, didn't weren't, weren't as often used. There's a real downside of this community too that I just want to say. And, and I- We were I, supposed to be inspiration. For- <laughs> <laughs> there is a real downside. I mean, if you go way back, way, way, way back when search funds first started, I mean, the investors were Joel Peterson and Irv Grossbeck and Bill Egan. And like, they were just, there were like six people that invested in all the first search funds. And what those six people had in common is they had no need for liquidity at all. And so they cut their weeds and watered their flowers. That's what they did. I mean, Irv's still an investor in Insurian 27 years later, you know, which has turned out a pretty, pretty good pretty good hole. Um, Search fund investors that have to raise money from external sources, they can be be sources of pressure to sell. And why is that? I can tell you why, because I I have the same pressure as running a private equity firm, which is I have to go raise money for my next fund. Well, what do my investors, oh, they want to see liquidity. Well, what can I sell? When I need liquidity, I'm going to sell my best companies, which is, again, the dumbest possible thing you can do. So there is a real downside to the the funds in search fund world. And so I'm not saying that because I love, I'm an investor in some of the funds. I love the people who run the funds, but I just want to put that on the table. So everyone's talking about that dynamic openly, but whether they are doing it intentionally or not, there is pressure from them to sell their best companies, to show investors returns. And once again, I would say selling the business is a super blunt, instrument and there's 30 other ways that they should solve that. Last question, then I want to open it up. I'm sure we've got a whole bunch of uh, questions from the group that uh, we'll, we'll try to uh, field as many as we can. We hear from students all the time, probably Mark and I get this question all the time. You know, when, when will I be ready? When, you know, when will I know that I'm ready to go and, and do a search and be a CEO? How will I know? You know, it, and it gets to this, you know, sort of not not now yeah. uh, third principle of yours. Um, what would you say to those to those folks? And and how yeah. would you encourage them to get to the bottom of that underlying fear, really, where that that question comes from? It's a great question. I mean, my flippant answer of when you're going to be ready is never. You know, that's like my flippant answer, and it's it actually is the answer. You're never going to feel like you're ready. We just raised a new fund, and I don't feel like we're ready to raise that. Like I'm, I'm, I have all the insecurities and limiting beliefs and panic and sleepless nights, and so I think you're never going to feel ready. So just as long as you realize that that time's never going to come. One thing that I think is really helpful to do, though, is write down your fears. So what am I afraid of? Here's what I'm afraid of. You know, I'm afraid that. I might not buy the right business. I'm afraid that I might not be able to pay my bills. I'm afraid that I might get to the two years and not have a company. I'm afraid that I buy the company and I don't know how to run it. Like, so write down, like, be very specific with what it is that you're afraid of. The reason to do that is you're getting these fears out of your subconscious mind where they can be really hurtful and harmful and they can, they can keep you from doing act taking action. But but the most insidious thing is a lot of times you don't even realize that they're there. So you may be like, gosh, I'm I'm going to just take this safe job. But you know, what you don't realize is the thing that you're worried about is that you're not going to be able to raise the money or that you're not going to be able to find the company. When you write them down, all of a sudden they become just to-do items. You know, How would I learn how to buy a business? How would I learn how to finance my company? How would I meet investors? How would I partner with people that would help me find a good company. Those are all stuff you've all spent your whole lives solving, right? Those are just those are just problems that you you've spent 30 years becoming great at solving as opposed to being these like nebulous fears. So that that's an exercise that I find I, I still do that right now and it's unbelievable. It's it's a, it's a and the coaching term for it is writing down your limiting beliefs. Yeah. 
yeah, I've found that when I when I have trouble sleeping, to to have a journal by your bedside, yeah, you know, to, just to, to get it out there. Yeah, the, the the your your fears are the scariest when they're in your recesses of your mind, and they're the least scary when they're just looking at you're looking at them with your conscious mind on paper. I believe we have uh, four mics strategically placed throughout the room. Uh, so if you have a question, uh, just raise your hand, and a and a mic will hopefully find you. I can't see everybody, so I'll trust the mic runners to select. Um, Hey, um, hey! I'm sure you have hundreds of deals and offers and ventures and companies crossing your desk on a daily basis. Are there certain attributes about those deals, a level of maturity that when they come across your desk gets you to bite? Or is it a matter of understanding the people behind that business that gets you that follow -up? Yeah, good question. I'm going to answer your question I'm going to answer it a little bit differently, but what you asked, which is like, here's how I answer it. I'm a search funder and what am I going to buy and what, how do I know and what, what should I be looking for? Number one, two, three, and four you should be looking for is quality of revenue in the business. Quality of revenue. That, 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 like, you could almost just stop there. Quality of revenue, there's a number of things that go underneath that, you know, um, is the revenue recurring? Is it re reoccurring? Is it highly predictable? Does is it are, are the products and services mission critical? So they're going to do well in a recession. How high are the switching costs? Where someone could take your business away? Um, those are those are all things underneath that. You know, revenue retention, uh, attrition, customer attrition. Those are, those are all under revenue quality. But that's really the that's what you're looking for in a, in a company. The second thing that's kind of a close cousin to that that I like to think about is what are the what what are the variables endogenous or exogenous? You know, endogenous in my control, exogenous not in my control, and it's why I don't do venture capital. Yeah, um, because like the best venture capitalists in the world, you know, they, they they get it right one out of ten times. Product market fit, I still think is kind of exogenous release is something I don't know how to do. Building a sales team is endogenous. Hiring well is endogenous. Creating the right pricing structure, add-on acquisitions, all endogenous variables. So I want, I want my career to be won or lost on things in my control, not some exogenous. So what, you know, things that you see sometimes that are on that list, Medicare reimbursement, like you know, search it comes and says, gosh, you know, Medicare cut and whatever, and we're screwed. It's like, yeah, you kind of knew that before you bought the business, you know, like you, you do, right? That's not in your control. So I would just, that, that would be, if, if I had to just give you two, those would be the, the two things I would focus on. Right here. See, the hand right there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll go to you, you next. Um, I love to focus on people and how that should be at the center of any business. Do you feel like you have a methodology or approach to assessing like talent and fit for talent that gives you a competitive advantage? And has that been boiled down to like, this is our process and these are the steps? Yeah, good question. So the question, if you couldn't hear, was people and talent and how do we assess it and you know the importance of it. I, I, I will, I'll do really quickly tell this quick story. So in 2008, the world's falling apart. I had my first ever executive coach. We had a call every Tuesday. And this, I kept trying to cancel this one call and we get on the phone. He's like, what's stressing you out? I'm like, oh my God, I got to fly to Dallas and fix this and Houston and fix this. Then I got to go to Chicago and this. And I'm doing all these diving saves. And long story short, we do this thing in coaching called the root cause analysis. Why, 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 why? The bottom of every single problem was the wrong person. Had the wrong CEO here, the wrong VP at Alpine here, the wrong CFO here. So it was, it was every, every, single, every single route was a problem. And that's when I just changed and I said like, Okay, I am in the talent business. You know, that's really the business that I'm in, and I think all of us ultimately are in the talent business. That's the true business, no matter where you go into. So, if you're a searcher and you're buying a business, your first three hires are your co-founders. You should treat them as such. Would you? How would you hire a co-founder? Would you just meet three people, and the one that's the best of those three, who's willing to move to Chicago, is the one you should pick? No. 
you would have a much more extensive process because you know A's hire A's and B's hire C's. So if I hire a B VP of sales, the entire stack underneath that is going to be B's and C's. If I hire a B CFO, I'm going to have B's and C's. Conversely, A's hire A's. So those you're going to compound greatness in those first three key hires that you get you make to treat it with that kind of intensity. In terms of your question, two more things I'd say. In terms of your question on, you know, how do you know? <laughs> Again, that could be a six-hour process. Um, I would say just we use the methodology called top grading, which is in the book Who by G. H. Smart. So I, I won't go through all that because I think they they'll they'll explain it better than I would. But the thing that people miss about hiring, there, there was this great meme that was on social media that said, "Okay, here's what I want you to do. You know, make a list of all the characteristics. You know, if, if you're looking for a to get married, okay, make a list of all the characteristics that you want in your spouse, and then be that list." <laughs> and I was like, "That's freaking awesome advice." And it's kind of the same thing with hiring. It's like your first job is to make yourself and your company and the role that you're hiring for the role that the A plus player would take. Okay. That's your first part is like, you're going to meet this A plus person that's amazing. You know, are you the, the role that they should take in this part of their career? And it took me a while to figure that out. And once I figured that out, I mean, we've been able to attract just about anyone we want for just about any role we want. So make yourself the business where they should want to go work. And there's a lot of stuff that goes into that empowerment, uh, equity. They have to work with other great players. They have to have clear definition of role, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Uh, top three leadership folks that you look to for leadership wisdom. You know, that's a hard question. Um, I, I think of a good book as like there's one concept in there that is like been with me for 25 years. So I'll give you the concepts and the books that came with them. Number one, Good to Great by Jim Collins. The concept was get the right people on the bus and the wrong people off the bus. There's a lot of other great stuff. All his books are great. Number two is the book Switch by Dan and Chip Heath. There's a lot of amazing things in that. But the number one thing that I took from that was scale your bright spots. 95% of all the intelligent strategic decisions we've made <clears throat> have come from this one question, what's working and how do we do more of that? It sounds so simple, but everyone looks at their problems. They try to fix stuff. All your money is going to be made by scaling your bright spots. That came from that book and that's been life-changing. Number three would probably just be like the Warren Buffett letters because he just does such a good job of like describing the difference between a good business and a bad business. People always think that Buffett's outdated. He's not. It's the same stuff. A hundred years from now, it's going to be the same stuff. Another big believer in revenue quality. Yeah, exactly. That's that's all he does is revenue quality. That's that's all he focuses. I mean, and so that stuff's never going to get outdated. In whether it's crypto or you know dot coms, it's it's still the same stuff. Hopefully, we have this mic working now. Try that again. There we go. Uh, really similar question to the one uh, two questions ago. You talked about uh, 500 entrepreneurs that you've helped cash out, and you talked about those employees who you had to lay off in your first acquisition and just kind of hung their head. Have you had experiences where you found in those businesses that you bought people that could become those A players but uh, never had the chance before? How have you found or worked with those to bring up instead of on? All the time. We find this all the time. It's one of the reasons that I love my job is we go in and measure employee net promoter score and employee engagement the day that we buy the business, okay? And then we measure it every quarter after and we hold our CEOs accountable to that. And we have a whole program to engage employees. And the, the simple way to describe the program is, and, and I'm not doing it justice, but let's say that I'm the CEO and I walk into a new business. I'm going to work with a coach and I'm going to get clear on, quote, my vision. By the way, I'm going to do a 90-day tour. I'm going to ask employees. I'm going to sit down with them. So actually, I'll back up. So I, I, I took, took over a business. I go to all the locations. I'm sitting down with people. What's going well? What else? What else? What else? What's not going well? What else? What else? 
you know, if you were me, what would you do? Where are our priorities? What, what's going, you know, what, where are we wasting time, et cetera. And the number one thing that I always get people to say is, you know, I've worked at this company 15 years and no one's ever asked me my opinion before. Just listen, you know, just listen. I mean, like, listen, not because you're pretending like you're listening, but listen like because you care because the, my coach always says, the answer is always in the room. The people that are there, they know exactly, like you don't have, you know, if you go and hire McKinsey, no offense to McKinsey, you know what they're going to do? They're going to go interview your employees and your customers, and they're going to take that information and sell it back to you. Say, like, well, why don't you just do that? The other benefit of, it's true. But in, but in a really nice deck. It's true, yeah. I mean, and Yuri, by the way, the people in this room, other people doing that anyway. So it's like, so just do that. And you have the other benefit that if it's you doing it, you're building trust with those people while you're asking those questions. They're like, Graham actually cares what I have to say because I do. Then you form a plan, which has been our plan. It's not Graham's plan. It's, it's the entire company's plan. And then you roll that out in concentric circles. So first it's me with my coach, then it's me with the senior executive team, then the executive management team. And eventually, and each time you're getting input from everybody and you're tweaking it a little, not because you are trying to do that to, you know, to show that you're doing it, but because you actually want people's input. By the time you end up with a plan, you know, it's our plan. That's a simple analysis, but 1000% employees, most employees have never been given a chance. Most employees, you know, don't know what is expected of them. They're doing that day that I told you about commuting to work. That, and that, that's what, that's what 99% of the workforce looks like. And it's so fun to see those folks emerge. It's incredible. It's incredible. We've got time for probably two more questions. Uh, I see a hand up right, right here. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. So I wish you could speak uh, very briefly about the current macro environment and how is that changing the focus of the funds that can be raised. Yeah. Well, <laughs> um, the cr I don't think people really realize what's really like the long term impact of high interest rates. Uh, we are. We haven't seen it. We haven't even started to see it. Like we're in, we're in, uh, we're in the very early innings. I mean, big, 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 big picture. All of us here in this room are in the business of private equity in some form. Allocations to private equity have been increasing over the last 25 years since I've been in the business. That's because interest rates have been going down. And so the alternatives are, are really bad. Right now, if you're a pension fund, you can get 12% unlevered returns on senior secured debt in great companies with like 25% loan to value. I mean, that's money good. Like, why do you need private equity? You don't. So long-term, there's gonna be, if interest rates stay high, there's gonna be massive implications on the, and it'll take years, you know, the, the allocations take a long time, but that's, if interest rates stay up, that's, that's ultimately what's gonna happen. All the trends that we've seen over the last 25 years are gonna go the other way, which is pretty dramatic. Like, I mean, we were buying plumbing and HVAC businesses 10 years ago for six times EBITDA, those same businesses are now trading for 18 times EBITDA and they're, and they're the exact same companies. Nothing has changed. How does it go from six to 18? Supply and demand. There's way more money in the system. That money's going to be out of the system over time. So long, long term, if they stay high, it's pretty dramatic. In terms of what's going on right now, I mean, the obvious thing is debt's a lot more expensive and therefore leverage levels will come down. Therefore, you should be paying lower prices for businesses. Uh, and if you're not, then you're, you, you, probably, you probably don't want to do the deals until you can kind of see a little bit of an offset for price, which you know, it takes a little bit of time for the su supply and demand to match up. And they're getting there. It's getting there now. There's more stuff for sale. But look, at, in a 5.5% in a uh, SOFR environment, a business is worth less than it was in a 0% in a SOFR environment. So there's a lot less things trading hands because there's just not a match yet of expectations and price. I'm uh, Billy from Indonesia. So of uh, what you shared earlier, there are 30 different ways to make money besides selling your companies. That is what uh, a lot of the family businesses in Asia has been doing. Like, like if you ask your grandfather, they will tell me like, oh uh, no, we, the business is for everyone. It's for legacy, it's for my children, for my grandchildren. They never think about selling. But right now, if you come to Southeast Asia, everyone is thinking about selling their business, PE funds. And uh, now we're talking about ETAs. Like, uh, a lot of the ideas I got was that we have access to PE firms right now. So we actually thought the PE firms of what they're looking for. 
So that's why we build our search funds in search of exit to them. Like that's what I see. It's quite refreshing to hear from you that that is not the right way. So yeah, I wanted to see like beside dividends, uh, what else are you looking at when you acquire a firm that you are planning to hold for I think 50 years, 60 years? Is that what you're looking at? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah I mean, there, there's a, thanks for the question. You know, there's a, there's a new um, financial innovation that we've been using called continuation vehicles where we just did one last week. I think it was the largest ever. Uh, we, we sold our plumbing and HVAC business. Basically, we set up a new vehicle, a new set of investors and sold it to that and cashed out the fund it's in and kind of reset the clock for another period of time for the reasons I just said, which is like you go all through all the trouble to build this incredible company, the most value destroying thing you can do is sell it. And so that is one example of a, of a new innovation that you can use. Um, the other one would be, you know, if you have, if you have 20% investor who's trying to new, raise a new fund and they want to get out, like you don't have to sell the company. And they, gosh, I'm, I'll be on, you know, talk to a searcher and they say, oh, you know, I talk, you know, I talked to Raymond James and I talked to the investment banker. They're like, now is a perfect time. you got to sell because, you know, there's these strategics and they're going to pay another extra multiple point. I'm like, who gives a shit? Like you're going to hold this business five years. Like that extra multiple point is irrelevant, you know? And, and if you go and ask the barber, they're going to tell you you need a haircut. If you talk to an investment banker, they're going to tell you right now it's the perfect time to sell. I don't care what the timing is or the industry or the, like, it's always the right time to sell. And if you start to engage the board on the conversation, again, I hate to say it, but the board has, they got a fundraise, like nothing gets them more jazzed up than liquidity. So they're going to also tell you it's time to sell. And you're young and you're like, these are your advisors. And these are people that you're looking to for answers. And they're all going to give you this. The exact wrong advice. I'm sorry, but it's just, it's true. Graham, I should have mentioned we have a lot of investment bankers in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I, I, if I was an investment banker, I'm sure I would be saying the same thing because, you know, that's, that's the business that they're in, but it's not, it's not in your, uh, not in your interest. Focusing on revenue quality and businesses that are enduringly profitable is, is a winning strategy. And if you can own those businesses for a long time, uh, it, it tends to tends to work out. I think we've got time for one more question. If there's uh, anyone out there, um, see one right. Hi, Graham. So my question is, um, when did you feel like you made it? As in, for me, I'm sometimes struggling with with who I am, a sense that I don't complement my achievements. So when did you feel like you made it? Was it at Alpine or when you do it rowing? When <laughs> that's or is, all, or is that, it today? That, yeah, that stage, that's, that's, that's it. That, you, you have no idea how good of a question that is. <laughs> 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 like the, that's a pretty deep, deep question. Um, I, I'll give you the sort of shallow answer and then I'll, I'll, I'll try to give you the deep answer. <laughs> The shallow answer, like, if you just look at Alpine, we started in the current form of the normal fund in 2001. Uh, we started, we lost money on our first fund, so that would not be making it. Then the next two funds were good, but not great, kind of top quartile, but not, not like write, something to write home about. Then we got flattened with the Great Recession. So we had five years where we didn't raise a fund and I drained my savings account to make payroll. So I wouldn't say we made it then. And then we started kind of clawing back. And, and then really we did the, the real work. The real work started after the recession. That's when I hired a coach. That's when I decided we were going to be the number one performing fund in the world. That's when we really started doing the work. And I, I guess I had to wait 10 years to realize you know, that I needed help and that I was going to really focus on myself as a leader and a CEO. Um, then what happened is we started doing the work and we started doing really, really, really good work, but it didn't show up in our results because of the things I mentioned before, which is we cut our weeds and watered our flowers. So this, our exits were like all the crap and then we were compounding our winners. So really the answer was like between 2018 and 2021, we started selling stuff because the software market was crazy and we, we started selling selling our businesses. And so two things happened. One is we took stuff from unrealized to realize. Investors did, didn't really give us credit for the unrealized. But the bigger thing that happened is we like literally doubled the enterprise value when we sold the businesses. So we were holding them way too low. 
So all of a sudden in like three years, we went from being decent to literally being the number one performing private equity fund in the world. So the answer to when we made it <clears throat> was say 2021. Okay. I started the company in 20, 2001. So 20 years. And by the way, that wasn't when I started private equity. I started 10 years before that. So pretty much almost 30 years in the business when we made it by conventional standards. Now I'll give you the, that's the shallow answer. The deep answer is The most depressing thing that can happen to you is you hit your goals because you realize that there's nothing there. Like what's there at the end of your goals is you. It's still you. So whatever problems or things you're running away from or issues you have or um, things you thought would change when you become this great thing, you know, that's still up to you. So. It's, it's been kind of a weird journey when I just had my head down for so, so long, for 29 years to, to do the, what I, the journey that I just described to you. And that took every ounce of everything that I had. And then getting there wasn't what I thought, you know? I mean, I'm really proud of our firm and I'm proud of how I've grown, but it's, you know, that's what I said in my, in my talk earlier. You gotta enjoy the process because there's really, I, I hate to say this, but there's nothing, there's no end. There's not like you, it's not like you get this award and all of a sudden all you know everything's great. So, you know, you're going to live your entire life in the journey of this and so just make sure that's, you know, something that you're excited to to be on. Um, probably the way I would answer the deep part of that. I can't think of a better way <laughs> to wrap up our session. Um, Graham, you've given us all so much to uh, bring into the rest of our day and and think about and consider as we're uh, hearing from people in, in and around the ETA community. Um, on behalf of Booth and Kellogg and the entire community here, I can't thank you enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.